Okay, so we're going to look at chapter five from Core Pure One, which is on volumes of revolution. And this comes up again in chapter two with just harder types of integration, but it's exactly the same theory. So if this chapter concerns how we can find the volume of a solid when a curve is revolved around either the X or the Y axis. So we're going to do a few different things. We're doing it around the X and the Y axis, and then we're going to do some more complicated volumes, including adding and subtracting. And there's also going to be some things on modeling as well, which is the most popular way that this question is asked. So first of all, I'm just going to recap some stuff from year one. We're going to talk about how you find the area underneath a graph. Well, when you're looking for the area underneath a graph, we know that the integral of y with respect to x between a and b gives us the area bounded between y equals f of x, which is the line, x equals a and x equals b and the x-axis. And so why does that actually happen? Well, let's talk through what I've got written on this next slide here. So what I've said inside this blue box is that if we split up the area, this whole section here, if we split it up into thin rectangular strips, each with width dx and with the height will be y, which is f of x. So all of these heights sort of vary as you move across the function. Then, for the, sorry, so the y is f of x for that particular value of x. So that's why they're varying. Each of these strips that we've got here have got an area of f of x multiplied by dx. So if we had discrete strips, and when I say discrete, I mean in the same way that we'd use the word discrete in um, statistics, that they are not going to be continuous. The total area would be the sum from x equals a to b of f of x multiplied by dx. That's what we would actually be doing to find out the area. We'd be adding up all of those strips together. But because we make the strips become infinitely small and we think continuously instead of discrete, we change the sigma sign that's like this to the continuous version of the sigma sign. And we still have that f of x dx between a and b. So these two things that I've got written here and here are the same as each other, apart from this one is a discrete idea, and this one is continuous. And I don't think people really realise that this symbol and this symbol are both sigma. This one is for discrete, and this one is for continuous. So that's actually where area works. And we're going to try and extend this idea now to volumes of revolution. So usually I have these GIFs here, but I'm going to show you some volumes of revolution on here. So what I'm talking about is like the outside edge of this would be the curve. And we're going to be revolving this curve around either an x-axis or a y-axis so that it kind of spins and forms a solid shape. So there's one of the examples that we've got there. The second one here, you can see that the curve is kind of like a normal distribution or like a hill kind of shape. And when that is rotated all the way around the x-axis, in this case, it creates that kind of 3D shape. And we're going to try and find out the volume of that 3D shape. I've just got one more of them that I want to show you. I'll just wait for this one to finish. So you can see this kind of curve that goes, has a maximum point and a minimum point. As it rotates around the x-axis, it creates this kind of surface that we could fill up with water, it creates this solid shape that really, if you tilt your head, it looks like a vase. So these are the kinds of shapes that we're going to be investigating in this. We're going to be investigating how we can create these 3D shapes out of the lines that we've got here. So when we're talking about volumes of revolution, what we're going to be supposing is that we spin this line y equals f of x about the x-axis to form a solid. And this is known as a volume of revolution. So my next few slides are going to kind of show what's happening. So you can see how this f of x line has kind of spun partly away around here. So it's kind of come down to the bottom and it's spinning around in this kind of direction. And as it spins all the way around, we can see that we've got this um, almost like a sort of vase shape, if you imagine like tilting your head so that this was the top of the page. And it looks like it's been made up of lots and lots of discs, really. And so you can see that for our volumes of revolution, that this, um, this sort of 3D shape that we're creating here could be made up of, of lots of discrete cylinders. OK, so this is if, if, if it is being spun about the x axis. So this is going to be about the x axis. So it looks like it's going to be lots of cylinders. Let's see if we can find out the volume of one of the cylinders. 
Now we know that the volume of a cylinder is pi r squared h. So the volume of one cylinder would be pi. Now the radius in this case, you're kind of having to tilt your head here. The radius is from the central part up to the edge. So it's going to be y. So it's pi y squared. And this time, the height of this cylinder is just this little bit that we've got between these two points. It's this line here, which is dx. So the volume of one of these cylinders is pi y squared dx. And again, we're wanting to do it between a and b. So if we were going to be doing it in, in a discrete way, we would be doing pi y squared dx from x equals a to b. But we don't want to do it in the discrete way. We want it to be the continuous way. So the volume of revolution, and this is about the x-axis. This is the formula that you will need to know, is that the volume is equal to pi y squared dx integrated between a and b. But the more common way that we write this is we put pi outside the front, because you can multiply by pi before or afterwards. And it's going to be between a and b of y squared dx. Now, there's a couple of things I want to point out about this. Because it says dx at the end, you'll notice here that the limits also must be x limits. So the limits match the d part at the end. So what I mean by this is we're talking about limits that are on the x-axis, and so it says dx, because in a minute we're going to be thinking about what happens when we rotate it about the y-axis. Okay? So if we were going to be doing it around the y-axis, here's my diagram of one that's now rotating um, with this as kind of the central axis of rotation. We can see that everything kind of switches around. So the height of the cylinder is dy. The radius of the cylinder is x squared. And we would be integrating it. I suppose I should have really added in here a and b. And again, this time you'll notice that a and b are on the y-axis because of that dy part that we've got there. So if you're rotating it around the x-axis, it is pi y squared dx, and the limits would be x limits. And if you're rotating it about the y-axis, it would be pi x squared dy, and the limits would match the dy part that go at the end there. So just before we do some actual examples with this, I've got a few different vases that I've drawn down here. And I want to think about which of these have not been created like a volume of revolution. So just pause, have a little think to yourself, which of these are the ones that have been created in some kind of volume of revolution? And which ones haven't? So I think this first one that we've got here, I think this one has been created by a volume of revolution. I think that this little line that I've drawn in here is my f of x, and it looks like it's being rotated about the y-axis. So I've done that one in green to say, yes, I think it has been. I also think that this gold and blue one is a volume of revolution, and this looks like the equation of f of x. And you can, you can have separate parts of the f of x. You could have it in like three separate sections like this one. So I think it has been. This blue and green one here, I think also has a volume of revolution and there's its little f of x on the outside there. And this one, you could do this one as volumes of revolution, but actually this one probably doesn't e even need volumes of revolution, but it is, it's got an f of x that is just these three separate sections. If you want to do this one without volumes of revolution, you could just do this one as lots of different cylinders, couldn't you? Because there are just three cylinders being stacked together here. Now, these last ones cannot be done like a volume of revolution. And the reason why is because this one has got all of these kind of ridges on it. And when we do these um, these volumes of revolution, you'll notice that this one here is smooth. This one here is smooth. This one here is smooth. They've got to be smooth surfaces for it to be able to be a volume of revolution. This one is not going to be a volume of revolution because it's smooth. And last of all, this one is not going to be a volume of revolution because it doesn't have that kind of um, cylindrical property to it. As you look over in these diagrams, they're all made up of cylinders. This one, you can't think about this being made up with cylinders because it's got this square shape as we move down here.
So that's the theory. We're now going to start applying this theory into lots and lots of practice. And it's just going to get you really, really good at integration and substituting with limits.